This National Professional Anglers Association video presentation is brought to you by Missouri Secrets Tackle and 241 Inc. Productions. There was no NPAA back when I got started 25 years ago. There was no instruction, no way to figure this whole business out. And so a lot of what I figured out was simply by making mistakes. Um, but, uh, you know, I never set out to be involved in the fishing tournament business or in sponsorship. Um, I lived in Iowa back in 1993 when this kind of started. Um, I owned a magazine called Hawkeye Outdoors. It was an Iowa hunting and fishing magazine. And I, uh, um, we had some anglers from Iowa that made the Professional Walleye Trail Championship up on Lake of the Woods in 93. And I decided it'd be a good place to go up and do a story and follow these uh, Iowa pros and uh, write a story for the magazine. So I went up and uh, attended the PWT championship and kind of was amazed at what was happening in walleye tournament fishing. It was basically 20 years behind bass tournament fishing, but it had a lot of traction. It was really growing. And as I was driving home from this tournament, I got to thinking about the need for a circuit for weekend tournament fishermen. You know, you had the PWT, which is a pro-am, but um, I just felt like there's a real need for weekend tournaments. So by the time I got home, I had already had a plan in my head of how I could use walleye tournaments to promote the magazine around the state and how I could use the magazine to promote the fishing tournaments. And the Iowa Walleye Tournament Trail was born out of that. And we had 17 two-person teams at our first tournament. And within three or four years, we were filling a 60-team field in most of the tournaments because there was a huge need for it. And I was tweaking the rules and, and adjusting the format in such a way that as I saw issues to weigh that things would, were, what worked and what didn't work and so forth. And uh, so that's how I got started. And, and soon, early on, I realized obviously I need sponsors because I was getting a small cut of the entry fees, but it, was, uh, it wasn't even enough hardly to pay for my gas to run these tournaments. So I started approaching companies and learned the hard way that it's very, very difficult. Now I thought Berkeley, they lived an hour, Berkeley factory was an hour from where I lived. I figured that'd be an easy one, you know. I couldn't get anybody at Berkeley to return my calls. And uh, there was a couple people here that were early adopters that really helped me out. Uh, Bruce with Offshore Tackle was one of my first sponsors. Tony with Bait Rigs, was, that's 25 years ago now. He was one of my first sponsors that believed in me. And uh, believe it or not, I signed a couple of pretty big ones in the mid-1990s. I signed US Cellular because one of their reps fished our tournament and he hooked me up with the right guy and part of our sponsorship was I got a bag phone and I couldn't use it except when I was close to Interstate 35 because there were no towers where I lived but US Cellular was a sponsorship and then one of the guys that had been fishing our tournament for a while came up to me and he goes you know my fishing buddy that I go to Canada with is the CEO of the biggest Pepsi bottler in the state of Iowa you want his number? I'm like, really? I'll take it. We signed Pepsi as a sponsor, and then things really started to happen because that looks pretty good on your on your tournament. Um, then we signed Ranger and Mercury, and things were coasted. Things were going pretty good. It was really growing, and then the company come along and offered to buy the magazine. And I thought, you know, I've, I've wanted to kind of do some of my own tournament fishing. I could focus on my freelance writing and I could grow these tournaments. So I sold a magazine and uh, um, the, Grand, uh, the Hawkeye, it, was, it started out as the Hawkeye Outdoors Walleye Trail. And then after I sold the magazine, it became the Iowa Walleye Tournament Trail. So um, it was doing really good. And then in the late 1990s, a couple of brothers from Minnesota, their name was Miller, and they came down and they fished the Iowa Walleye Tournament Trail. I thought it's kind of weird guys from Minnesota come down and fish the, the Iowa circuit, but they fished the whole circuit. And then the next year there was a Minnesota Walleye Tour. And I got on their website and guess who is running the Minnesota Walleye Tour, the Miller brothers. And I, I clicked on their rules and all of their information and they had taken my rules and they had crossed, they had just wiped out 
Iowa Walleye Trail and put in Minnesota Walleye Tour. I mean, they copied it identical, the whole format, prices, the entry fees, everything, they just copied it identical, and it blew up on them. And I went, man, why didn't I do that? So about that time, um, I watched them grow, and in November 8th of 2000, I had a fire that destroyed my office. And uh, I knew I had to make some changes, and so we packed up and moved to the Brainerd area of Minnesota. My wife and I had been um, vacationing up there for years, and so we packed up, moved up there, and uh, I took some of the, the money from an insurance settlement, and then I, call, I, I worked with some of my sponsors to help to, to get some of them to grow with me as I expanded, and then um, I also pulled in a couple of new sponsors, and we launched the Grand National Walleye Cup, which had seven states with a four tournament format with a state championship, and then each of the state, the top teams from the state championship went to a national championship. And what you see up here is, uh, is, a, is a national championship. Um, at that time, the sponsorships that I was selling was a three-part sponsorship. It was, it was a magazine, and it was me, and it was the tournament circuit. And as an outdoor writer, I had a unique opportunity to promote sponsors through the magazine writing that I was doing. And so I was learning at the time how to get really good at talking about products without making it sound like a bold-faced product plug. You know, have you ever read something or seen a seminar where the guy goes, well, I pulled up my Ranger ZX-52 up to the spot and I dropped my Minn Kota Trova in the water and I picked up my Abu Garcia XYZ reel and I casted out my shad wrap on my 10-4 fire line and in the seminar everybody's eyes are rolling back in their head. In the magazine they're turning the pages. If you see it online, click, you're gone. Okay, meaningful sponsorship plugs are so important. I'll get into that here in a little bit. But so as this thing was growing, I went, okay, what's the next step? Then this is in the early 2000. I'm like, TV. I want to get this on TV. How do I get it on TV? I'm going to need a lot of money to get this on TV. So I started looking at different companies and uh, I talked to Ranger and Mercury and they're like, yeah, we want to be involved, but we, we, can't, we can't do it at the level that you need to. And I, I looked at Gander Mountain and where our tournaments were across the Midwest and the East Ohio and and Michigan and so forth, if you looked at where all the Gander Mountain stores were at that time, it was a perfect footprint of where our tournaments were. So I started trying to get through to Gander Mountain and it, if you've tried to get through to a big company and sponsorship before, you find out that the bigger ones, they have what they call, a, what I call a gatekeeper, which is a person basically who filters the stuff that comes in because they have loads and loads of sponsorship proposals come in. So. I figured out who this person was and I called her and talked to her and, and uh, they have like they go through all this stuff and they'll have a stack over here and then they'll have a stack over here and this stack gets shoved in the garbage and then it gets a letter that says thanks but no thanks. This stack gets handed to the, promo, the promotions manager, the VP of marketing, the brand manager or whoever is the final decision maker on the sponsorships. So I wanted to be in that stack. So I kind of established a relationship. I called this girl several times and talked to her and kind of, kind of my enthusiasm came through for what I was going to do and I was so excited about it and, and everything. And um, I said, if I send you a proposal, would you personally hand it to him? And she said, okay, nobody's ever asked me that before. I'll do that. So I called her back and I said, did you give, did you give it to him? And she said, yeah, he's, he read it and he said he's going to consider it. So I'm like, ooh, I'm past the gatekeeper. Well, I wasn't really past the gatekeeper yet, but a couple weeks later, she, I was talking to her again, and she said, okay, here's his direct line, and here's his email. Now I'm past the gatekeeper. So I started sending him emails, started leaving him messages on the phone, nothing. It just nothing happening, nothing happened. And this is, you got to be persistent to the point of being a pest sometimes, okay? And Barry Day with Berkeley told me that. He said, you're the most relentless person I've ever met. I said, is that a compliment? <laughs> but uh, anyway, I wasn't getting through. I wasn't getting through. And so I, you know, I kept calling her ever so often. And one day she says, you know, he comes in about 6.30. And once in a while, um, if the phone rings between 6.30 and 7, sometimes he'll pick it up. 
I thought, that's a pretty good nugget of information right there. So I started calling him between 6.30 and 7 in the morning, almost every morning, and for weeks. I mean, I called him three or four times a week for probably two months. And every time I would call, I would just give him a little, just a little sales pitch, just, some, just a little cookie. I would say, hey, I see you're building a new store in Wichita. We fish a lake right near there. We can, we can have a way in right in your parking lot. And you can have, when you have a grand opening, we can get a couple of our anglers come in there and do, a couple, do some seminars. You know, or next time I might call up and say, hey, you know, Berkeley's one of our sponsors. They're coming out with a new line this year. We can really help you drive traffic and drive sales of this new line through the Gander Mountain stores. So I kept, every time I would give him just this, you know, just a, a little nugget. And uh, this went on for a couple of months. And by this time, I'm like, okay, this is, this is really going nowhere. I'm embarrassed that I'm calling this guy almost every day. And one morning I just got up and I sat down at my desk and I thought, all right. And I picked up the phone and when, when it went to his answer, me, she, she and I said, Bob, you know you're either going to have to call me back or join the witness protection program. Click. <laughs> he called me. And he said, uh, we need to talk. And I'm like, yeah. He said, I'm going to set up an appointment with uh, VP of marketing. We'll sit down together and we'll talk th this through. So I went down there and uh, I you know, Al talked about passion. Other people at this conference has talked about I always have called it enthusiasm. My enthusiasm, excitement for what I was going to do, it's something that you, can, you can't convey over the phone, you can't convey it in an email. You have to do it face to face. And I signed with Gander Mountain probably the largest circuit, walleye tournament circuit sponsorship that's ever taken place. I think it was over half a million dollars on a three-year contract with Gander Mountain. We had our TV show called Walleye Wisdom on the Sportsman's Channel. I bought another truck and trailer and things really grew and, and it was working good with Gander Mountain. Um, I also started working um, for Max Lure Company as a uh, marketing director where Max Lure Company is, a, is kind of a small company but they had a hundred pro staffers and when I took the job as marketing director for them, I looked at that and I realized that the only time they're hearing for most of these pro staffers is when the pro staffers would order their free product for the year. They weren't reporting, they weren't telling what they were doing or anything. That's the only time they ever heard from them. So I completely rebuilt their whole program where it was a three-tiered system. The first tier was you can buy as much product as you want as a discount. The second tier was you get a hat and a shirt and um, you get some free product every year. And the three tier, third tier, if you work your way up, was you, you get a jersey, you get all the free product that you need to use for your own personal use, and you could get some entry fees if you, you know, worked a, um, worked a booth at a sports show or if you were, uh, did an in-store promotion at a Cabela's or a Gander Mountain or whatever. So I, I rebuilt that. So that's um, kind of the long way around how I got to this point right here. Um, I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way, and I really don't want everybody to think that what I'm going to tell you here is the only way to do it, but this, is, this has worked well for me, and so I want to pass this along to you. And uh, hopefully, you know, the people here that have sponsors, um, you know, hopefully you get a few good nuggets of, of helpful information out of it. The people that are, don't have sponsors but want to have sponsors, hopefully this will be pretty revealing to you in many ways. So we're going to talk about how to sell yourself and how to value yourself. What are you worth? How to start small and then really get to work. What does a sponsor really want from you? Does a sponsor want you to win a bunch of tournaments? Does a sponsor want a guy that looks really buff in his tournament jersey? No, obviously. What a sponsor wants from you is can you sell our stuff? Can you sell my product? That's what they, that's the bottom line, okay? Then you gotta promote, promote, promote. The enthusiasm is such an important part of this, the passion. Media is your ally. We're gonna talk about how to use the media. Um, reputation and relationships is your golden ticket in this business, no other way to put it. Make the most of every opportunity and reporting is the secret to longevity. You'll be amazed how many people get a sponsorship and don't report and the sponsors just end up moving on because how do you, you might be out there working your tail off and how do they know it if you don't tell them, if you're not reporting it to them. 
So start at the beginning. The, I, I tell people nowadays, it, if you don't have a resume, don't even bother to try to, to approach larger fishing tackle companies. It just, it's not gonna happen. So build a resume, not, not necessarily a fishing resume, but a resume of um, small sponsors, like local sponsors, start small, and then you know companies around that might be able to help you out with some entry fees in exchange for a, a, you know, a logo on the boat or whatever. Non-endemic sponsors are sponsors that are not fishing related. You know, an endemic sponsor would be, a local one would be maybe a bait shop or a boat dealer or, or something like that. Um, you don't have to have sponsors in the fishing business. Look for the smaller, more aggressive companies for fishing gear. Um, there's a lot of uh, little companies that can't afford, you know, uh, you know, a pretty big name sponsor. They're looking for somebody that's willing to work hard and grow with them. But be careful in that situation, <clears throat> excuse me, because in that situation, sometimes there's a very low ceiling. And some of these smaller companies they're kind of using people as people come on board. They, they have a revol what I call revolving sponsorships where, you know, they, you get on there, they give you some free product, you start working for them, and pretty soon you realize you're not really going anywhere. You're just getting some free product. So you move on, and the next guy walks in, and, and they just kind of use people that way, and it's just kind of revolving. So be careful, the companies that you align yourself with. Um, and, and a common theme throughout this, please understand, if you're giving them something of value, you deserve to be paid. We don't give ourselves away. Um, how do you, here's how to do a proposal. Use photos, videos, links, clippings. Um, I recommend that you send an email proposal with, with links to Facebook posts, blog posts, um, any, any place that you, you're mentioned in a newspaper article, anything that would look good to a sponsor. Um, and then also mail a proposal in with, uh, you know, a DVD of like a, like a video resume um, and actual clippings and stuff like that. Might, you might have some newspaper clippings or whatever. Um, get, the, get an email and a phone number. Send the proposal and then call in most cases. Don't give them, don't try to negotiate until you actually get a meeting, okay? If possible, try to get a face-to-face -face meeting. It's so much harder for them to say no to you and to your face than it is. It's really easy to say no to somebody on the phone or in an email, but once you're sitting in front of them, it's just so much harder for them to say no. So try to get an in-face, in uh, face-to-face, in-person meeting if possible. Um, here's some tips on an engaging proposal. Show that you know the product line. Pick the companies that you already work with so you're you, you you already you're buying their stuff so you already think they're the best in the category um, and you know how to use them that's the companies you want to start with explain that you already have respect in your local committee and you already have a following illustrate that you know how to use social media I'm not going to go into too much detail on social media there's other seminars for that but uh, it's a very critical part of this um, add some references with the contact info and ask them to call them this, this, this kind of catches them off guard because a lot of times you see a resume and it'll say, references available upon request. If you put the references, I talk to some of your people who you think will, who you know will give you a good reference and then put their name and phone number on there and ask, say, call that guy, okay? That it has a lot more value. Convince them that they can trust you. There's a this is a really hard business to break into and sometimes it just feels like the person at that company is a complete jerk, okay? But they've been burned over and over and over again. They've given product to somebody who just never, never came back, never reported anything, just disappeared, you know? Um, so it goes both ways. Everybody has to follow in, up on their end of the deal. So you gotta convince them that they can trust you, that you're in it for the long haul. Here's how to blow it. First of all, you focus on what they can do for you instead of what you can do for them, or you act like you're entitled to this. Barry Day, when he told me that he got as many as 60 um, requests for sponsorships a day at Berkeley, told me that half of them are just some guy who won a tournament somewhere and thinks Berkeley should now sponsor him. And those just, they have no value. 
So don't, don't be that guy. Don't be arrogant, don't brag, don't overpromise. Don't dis disrespect other anglers or other company. Everybody in this business knows everybody. So even if you're, um, you know, even if you had a bad experience with the competitor's product or something like that, don't, you know, just don't do it. Just avoid, always just be positive about the company you're working with. And uh, another way to blow it is just talk a lot and, and with them and, and don't really listen to what they have to say. When you talk, it should be something like, we want to form a mutually beneficial partnership where each of us gain something from it. Or, you know, tell me what products are you going to try to promote this year and how can I help you promote them? That type of thing. That's, that's what you want to look at. So how much are you worth? What should you ask for? Most cases, you're going to have to work for products first, even product discounts. But if you align yourself with companies, do the research and figure out that there's an opportunity to advance and specifically ask them that. Before they give you a bunch of tackle and rods and reels at a discount, just say, you know, what do I got to do to get to the next level? And if, there, if, there's no, if there's no next level, then you probably might as well move on. If you're going to be in this for the long run, you can't take rods and reels to the grocery store. You can't pay your mortgage with shad wraps. Um, so be realistic of what are, you, what are you willing to do it for. There's got to be a payoff somewhere. If you're giving them something of value, you deserve to be paid for it. You deserve compensation for it. So, um, you know, don't, let, don't be taken advantage of. Be creative in things. Um, sometimes they like to give away more product than you can use. Um, ask them, can I sell this on eBay for the stuff I'm not using? Um, some of them don't care. Some of them, you might lose your sponsorship if you do it. So ask them, you know, what channels can I use to turn some of this product into cash? Because a lot of times they might say, we'll give you $2,000 worth of product. Well, they're giving it to you at MSRP, where it actually costs them, you know, 800 So it's really good for them to give you, they love to give you product. But uh, just kind of be careful about that. So you got to be able to monetize some of it. Um, you could be creative. I'll give you an example of a, um, a, there was a sports show that I always really wanted to do seminars at in Minneapolis. And I just felt like it was a great market for me and, and for my sponsors. And I'd been calling them, trying to uh, convince them that I, I was a good guy to do seminars at, their, at the sports show. And finally, they called me back and they said, uh, we'd like to have you um, come and do seminars this year and we'll give you two nights in a motel and a free booth. And I went, I got to think about this, you know, how, how can I turn this booth into money is what I'm thinking. So I, I started thinking about it and what I did was I called up one of my sponsors and I said, would you be willing to um, send me $1,500 worth of product and a display for your company? I'll send at the end of the show I'll send the display back and I'll keep the product and, and throughout the show, um, you know, I'll, I'll work the booth and in the seminars I would say, hey, you know, if you got any questions, you want to talk more about this, just stop by booth whatever number and, and we'll chat. And then, so I, I worked the, the booth with this product and, uh, and then I would just casually say, you know, at the end of this show, I'm going to be selling this stuff at a discount because I want to take it all home. I ended up selling all that stuff, $1,500 worth of stuff. I sold it for $1,000. So I got the seminar, which is what I really wanted, and I got paid, basically got paid $1,000 to work the show. So there's creative ways to do it. Seminars are critically important for most sponsors. Um, the, the companies really like to have people who are willing to do seminars because face-to-face, in-person stuff is really valuable to them. But seminars are not for everybody. If you feel like your knees are going to give out and if you get up in front of like 300 people like, like we got right here, um, it might not be for you, but um, it, it, if you can do these, they, they give great value to the sponsors. And, uh, you know, you can get much better at doing seminars. You can take a class on speaking, practice and polish your speaking, focus on the things at which you excel. This is really important. And most cases when you're giving seminars, you don't know it, but there's probably people in the audience who are just as good or better at something as you are. So don't come off as a know-it-all, first of all, and second, focus on the things that you're good at. You, everybody has specific skills 
in fishing. So focus on those things so you know that you, you have confidence that what you're saying has value. Um, relax, have fun with it, don't come off as a know-it-all as I said, and inject sponsor plugs in meaningful ways. Um, I mentioned that earlier about the sponsor plugs and I'll talk about that more when I uh, get to the part on writers here. So you want to write, you want to work with writers. All writers have a continual need for new ideas, content, and photos. You know, I've written 1,300 magazine articles and it's hard to keep coming up with new ideas. And when I say magazine articles, I'm talking about also internet blog posts and um, um, like I write for several websites. Like I, I do a lot of hunting stuff. I, I write for Realtree.com and some of that. So, um, but I'm always looking for a new idea as a writer. So, you know, I did a, um, I went, Johnny Candle says, hey, there's a good bite going on here on Devil's Lake. So I went out there, did a uh, couple of, of my weekly columns for OutdoorHub.com on, uh, on that. And uh, this, Johnny, you know, he, he's, he's a master at this. He's very, very good at it. Um, you got Abel Garcia in here. You got a Shields hat on up there. You got a Shad wrap and a, are you Abel Garcia rod and reel? You got Mercury, you got Humminbird, you got Minn Kota right there. And it's, and it's, it's just a nice picture that works well with an article. And, um, you know, it, it's, got all the, it's got all the images there that a sponsor likes to see. And that article that I did on OutdoorHub.com is emailed to 120,000 people every day. So, um, you know, work with writers whenever you can or do your own writing. You can, you can, you can do blog posts and uh, podcasts or another thing that's really growing. So actively seek out the publication, look for websites that are looking for content. If, if you feel like you're a pretty good writer, and a lot of people are better writers than they realize until they just sit down and try it. Um, you know, Michelle Kilburn, I think, mentioned that they're looking for content for the Mercury site. There's a lot of uh, companies that have website that they're continually trying to drive traffic to, to sell their products. But, you know, one of the ways they drive traffic to is, is putting good stories and content on there. And this has really changed in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, as an outdoor writer, 10 to 15 years ago, I would get calls from websites and, and a lot of them would say, you know, we'll trade you a link in exchange for a story or we'll give you 50 bucks or something like that. It's like, I don't work for 50 bucks. You know, so I, w I refused to do any of that. And at that time, a lot of these websites were just, they were trying to get lots of content on there so search engines would find their website if a topic was brought up. But what they learned over time was that having all of that content like that on there didn't have near as much value as having really good quality content that would bring people back over and over. And for that, you got to pay for it. So some of the some of the places that offered me 50 bucks or a link for an article are now paying me 300, 400. Uh, Realtree.com pays me 500 for an article. So, you know, there's, there's pretty decent money in it. Um, learn to take good photos. Always have a supply of photos of yourself with sponsor products in it. And uh, that way, you know, if you get to find yourself in a situation, which is fairly common where uh, maybe a local writer, if you establish a relationship with a local newspaper writer, radio station, or um, all of the local outlets you should be working on getting involved with them. But especially like newspapers, a lot of times they'll call you up and get you some quotes. You know, can you just give me some good quotes on, on the walleye fishing on such and such a lake or bass fishing, you know, down here on a stream or whatever. And uh, then you, you say, hey, you need any photos? I got some photos here. Then you send them the photos and they're probably looking for a good photo. If, you, if you're a decent photographer, um, you know, you, you might get your sponsors stroked in, the, in that local newspaper or whatever. So get yourself a, a file on your computer and start putting photos in it. Um, speaking of sponsor mentions and sponsor plugs, this photo came from a story that I did on using deep diving crankbaits to catch smallmouth on rocky humps. And I use this as an example um, of why Fireline is really good for that type of fishing because it allows your crankbaits to dive deeper because it's, it's thinner and also you can feel the bottom better because it has no stretch. Um, that's something that sponsors love, 
okay? I, I've done so many articles on the, the, that the fire line's attributes were a part of the article. And this is what really works instead of those bold faced sponsor plugs I mentioned earlier. This is what the companies really love. Here's the attributes. This is what people can learn from um, using this particular product. Everybody gets paid. Okay, for example, I did a story on how Fireline's best for vertical jigging because you can feel every pebble on the bottom and you can feel the lightest bites because there's no stretch like Mono has. I've done stories on trolling wing dams with planer boards. Bruce DeShano loved that one. I've done Fireline uh, will allow your crankbaits to dive deeper because of its narrow diameter. Okay, everybody gets paid. It makes me look good. It, the sponsor got something out of it, and most importantly, the consumer got something of value. Instead of just seeing a list of your sponsors, what that consumer got was something he could use, help him catch more fish. And after all, like Al Linder said, what's the key? What, do you, what is every, the bottom line of what everybody wants? They want to catch more fish. So that's how to really um, give your sponsors benefit that way. And I gotta keep moving here, we're running a little bit behind. But this is an example of, uh, you know, photos that um, are good for, uh, for writers and just to have with you. And if you're, if you're doing your own writing, um, you know, supplement it with good photography. Here's an example of a story I did on spinnerbait fishing in a national fishing magazine. And uh, I just did a little sidebar on dipping your spinnerbait into gulp juice to give it some scent. And I mean, who? Not very many people have thought of that before. Berkeley eats this stuff up. They love this stuff, you know. If you can come up with nifty little ideas like that, your sponsors they'll, they'll love you. So you're not just selling sponsors' products. You're selling what the products can do. I think Kevin Van Dam mentioned something similar to this. Um, this lure will help you catch more fish. This outboard will get you to your spot faster. This line will not let you down when you hook the fish of a lifetime. See, you're not just selling the product, you're selling the image of what the product. You ever, have you, have you seen a car commercial uh, for a convertible that tells you what size of a motor it's got in it? No, what, they, they sh what they're selling you is the image of how cool you'll be and why a pretty girl will want to sit beside you if you buy this car. If you buy this beer, you'll be surrounded by pretty girls. Okay, that's how marketing it works these days. That's, um, and it works that way in fishing too. So those, these are some examples of, uh, of how, to, how to help sponsors sell their products. Social media is such an important part of um, what sponsors want these days. So learn the, the tricks of using Facebook and Instagram, YouTube, and so forth. Um, it's all very important. Uh, just a couple of tips. Um, did anybody go to, I think Joel Nelson was gonna do a seminar on social media, did anybody go to that? He may have told you these things already, but um, Facebook does not like hashtags, but Instagram does, okay? You can tag sponsors in Facebook, but if you tag it on the original post, then Facebook doesn't like to give it to people because they know you're promoting a company. So they're gonna to try to get you, they're gonna reduce your reach and they're gonna to try to get you to buy an ad. But if you, if you put the post out there, let it get a little bit of engagement, you get a few likes and some reach, then put the tag in there, then your sponsors will see it and, um, and your reach won't be as much reduced by Facebook. See, I, I do so much hunting stuff right now. I've got a YouTube channel with four million views and I've got um, two Facebook, one personal uh, public figure pa Facebook page and then I've got one for, I do a weekly email blast called Bucks, Bulls and Bears. It's got 51,000 subscribers now and I got a Facebook site for that and Facebook hates hunting. We, it's so hard to work around Facebook and hunting. I, I literally put a video up there of a um, me s with holding the bucks rack that I shot, and I Facebook took it down, and I got an email from them that said that it it pre it, uh, it showed animal cruelty, and I I fought with them over that and finally got them to put back up. But it they have a bank of people who approve 
videos and ads and, and posts and stuff like that. And if you get the wrong person, they can make it hard for you. Uh, fishing's not nearly as bad, but hunting is, it's really tough. So I've learned how to, you know, how to, how to get additional reach that way. Um, if you have a YouTube channel and uh, you will get more views from a video if you put the video both on YouTube and on Facebook, but don't put it on YouTube and then link it to Facebook because they'll reduce your reach. If you, if you do both, the one on Facebook will see, more people will see it. Um, and Facebook over the last five years has just gotten, they just want you to pay for everything. You, I've got, I got 8,500 likes on my Bucks, Bulls, and Bears page and 5,500 on my um, personal page. And, you know, maybe 300 people, will, 400 will see a post, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, boost this post for $50, you know. So um, it's frustrating. But uh, YouTube is just fantastic. It, my gosh, I can't believe the way it's growing. They're, the number of people who are making money and helping their sponsors on YouTube and figuring it out is really, really growing. There's a, um, I was just talking to Ben Gibbs with Aquaview, and he's got a guy in Canada that's doing ice fishing videos, getting unbelievable numbers of views. This guy, he's kind of a goofball, which helps, I guess. But he's, uh, um, first of all, think about this. Think about the subset of people in North America who, who ice fish, okay? And then think about the subset of the ice fishermen who fish for lake trout, okay? That's not a very big group of people. This guy has got, he has one video that had a million views in the first eight days. And, but, you know, it's not just ice fishing for lake trout, but he's like, his sandwich is frozen, so he puts it on his buddy heater to heat it up, you know, and I think people who don't have any experience with ice fishing probably are looking at this going, these people are nuts, you know, but I mean this, that, that's the type of thing, if you, if you can have a YouTube personality and, and put quality stuff on YouTube, do a, you know, do a review of a rod and reel, a two minute video of a, how to fish this, a drop shot or a crankbait or, you know, there, that stuff, um, it, it really works and the sponsors really like it, they, they might share it on their Facebook channel and get you a couple thousand views. So um, the biggest thing with Facebook is keep it up to date. Don't start a page and then ignore it for a week or two. The more you post up to a point, the, um, the more engagement you'll have. I wouldn't, I, normally um, the people who know this stuff basically say don't post over twice a day and uh, not, maybe not twice on every day even, but, um, and there's, the more people you talk to about Facebook, you get conflicting opinions because it seems like there, there's just no standard. But anyway, it's, it's a big part of the importance of what you can do for your sponsors. Reporting is the most overlooked part of keeping a sponsor happy. It's incredible the difference that it, it makes if you send in quarterly reports. And if you're starting small with a local sponsor, do reports on the, what you're doing for that sponsor and not only give it to them, but when you're ready to approach a major fishing sponsor, then you have a really good, um, something that's, that's really good to put in a resume because you, you can show that what you've already been doing and uh, that's how you build things up and little things really do add up. Um, I wanted to uh, mention this because most people think, don't think about this particular topic. This is actually, uh, a boat that we awarded for a, a tournament that I run with Al Linder called the Minnesota Fishing Challenge and it is a fundraising tournament for Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge, a, a nonprofit faith-based drug and alcohol re rehabilitation facility in Brainerd. Last year we raised two hundred ninety one thousand dollars in a one-day fishing tournament for Teen Challenge. And one of the ways we did it is I worked with London Mercury on this boat and everybody that raised at least $500 got their name in a hat and we drew, we had a drawing to give away this $20,000 boat. It's rigged out with Minn Kota and, and Humminbird. And uh, we traveled that boat around to a couple sports shows and I parked it on a, on a corner on Highway 210 in Brainerd and I put a big sign in it, win this boat and stuff like that. And then the Department of Transportation um, stats say that uh, about 4,200 cars a day drive down Highway 210 past where I parked that boat. 
See, all that information is available. Most people aren't willing to do the work to go find that and report it to their sponsors. Last year, Lund sold us the boat at a discount. This year, they gave it to us, and it's all because of what we were able to give them in return. So, you know, that's more money for transforming lives through Teen Challenge. Um, here is an example of what I've used for sponsorship um, reporting. This is an Excel spreadsheet, and I, this is just one I kind of made up. And this is a guy by the name of Wannabe Profish, and his, uh, this is his log for his sponsor, Humminbird. And if you go down through here, you can see some of the things that he did in about a month here. BassBoster.com forum, he answered questions on there on a thread about Auto Chart Live, and 1,366 people saw that. He, uh, he did a seminar at a boat dealer. He went fishing at Mega Bass Lake and, and put a photo of his day's catch on Facebook. He was at the boat ramp, and a couple guys came up and said, hey, how do you like that new hummingbird? So, you know, he talked to them a little bit, and he reported that, and that might only have an engagement or a reach of two, but that's important stuff for your sponsors because those guys are much more likely to buy a hummingbird now. So it's all worth reporting. Um, so if you go, kind of go down here, uh, he did some Instagram stuff. He, uh, he went to Lake Lucky, and he took a writer from the local paper fishing, and then uh, he did a live Facebook video on it. And then the local paper came out with a story and it's got photos of him with the hummingbird in there and uh, it has 13,000 circulation. Did a tournament on Lake Bucketmouth. He went to the local uh, tackle store and talked about the hummingbird onyx with the sales team. Did a YouTube video, blah, blah, blah. If you'll do this, you will be taking giant strides above most people in the fishing industry because most people just aren't willing to go the extra mile and do this. It's hard work, but uh, this is how you really take it to the next level with your sponsors. Your reputation is your golden ticket. Never overpromise, always overdeliver if possible. Everybody, did I say everybody knows everybody? I'm telling you, in this business, everybody knows everybody. Don't say a negative word to anybody about a product or about another person because that person, the people in this business, they move laterally a lot. You got a marketing director like Skeeter Yamaha. Um, Dave Itner today was, is a, the marketing guy for Skeeter Yamaha. He was my guy at Evinrude a few years, or not Evinrude, uh, at uh, Lawrence a few years ago. So people are moving all the time and if somebody leaves a job, the next person might move up or a guy from this company over here might move into that marketing position. If you had a really bad day on the water and you're crabby and you are rude to a, just a field promotions guy at the tournament or something like that, you might wake up in a couple years and find out that guy's your boss. I'm not kidding you. It, people, it's, that's the way this industry is. Just you know, swallow your tongue, don't burn bridges. Get to know multiple people in the marketing department. You know, I mentioned about how people move up. I always try to send the information to more than one person because if, if you're really involved with one person in that company, that person might think you're the greatest thing and they, they just give you a new contract and you sign it every year and you're coasting along and all of a sudden that person's gone, then what? Okay, you need to, you need to be involved with as many people in the marketing department as you can. Send your stuff to the VP of marketing, send it to the brand manager, send it, you know, the, the, there's different names for people that are involved in sponsorships. Some of the bigger companies, actually the better contracts, they actually have a committee that reviews them. So you want everybody to see your stuff. Um, the key to longevity is the relationships. Don't ever undervalue them, but remember that you're building a business. You build a business by creating a firm foundation and then you build on that foundation. So do each step really well and then slowly build on it. Stay on the edge of technology changes especially. You know, try to be the first one to come up with a new idea for promotions. And of course you gotta catch some fish. Now I haven't talked about that at all until the very end here and the reason for that is not that it's not important but it's not nearly as important as the rest of this stuff that I've all talked about. My opinion on tournament finishing, winning tournaments and so forth, is that 
you can have longevity in tournaments without ever winning a tournament. Your sponsors can pay your bills, but you have to catch enough fish to have credibility. Okay, when you do seminars, you, you have to at least be able to show that you know what you're doing out there. And uh, that, so that's, that's important is, uh, you know, you don't have to win a tournament. And if you ever do win a tournament, you sure want all this stuff I've talked about in place so you can take advantage of it when you do win the tournament. Because I don't care if you win the Bassmaster Classic, nobody's going to walk up to you and say, hey, you won the Bassmaster Classic, would you like a sponsorship? It just does not work that way. You, you're going to, bat, winning a Bassmaster Classic is going to open all kinds of new doors to you. But if you don't have all this foundation with the reports and stuff to show them that this is what I've been doing for the other companies, then you're not able to capitalize on a win like you would. So J. Paul Getty says, here's the secret to getting rich. Rise early, work late, strike oil. And that's kind of what tournament fishing is like. Build the foundation, and if you win a tournament, you're, you're really able to capitalize on it. So before I end here, I'll try to pay for some gas. I got a book called How to Catch, uh, How to Catch and Keep Sponsors, Get Paid to Fish. I wrote it with Jim Calcophone, former um, director of the Professional Walleye Trail, and it's on Kindle. It's only $5.99. It goes into way more detail than I could go into in a seminar in uh, 45 minutes here. Um, and uh, it's just an ebook. We don't have a printed copy, but I'd really suggest that you go on Kindle and download the book for $5.99. And um, it's got all five star reviews, so please don't give it a four star review. We're, we're on a roll. <laughs> um, but we'd, you know, we'd, uh, I'd love to have you see, to read the book, and uh, it's, it's just got a lot of really valuable information in it. We interviewed some really good people in the business that gave us some tips above and beyond what I've given you here. And uh, it came about in an interesting way. Jim and I were just sitting around his kitchen table talking about the fishing business. And I said, I've, I've always thought about writing a book because there's just nothing good out there about the fishing tournament sponsorships. Nobody's ever done a book on anything like that. And he goes, well, let's do it together. And so we just got out a yellow pad and we started making a list of the things that the book should cover. And we had about 30 things. And I said, well, you know, that's 30 chapters. And he says, okay, I'll do this one, this one, this one. I said, okay, I'll do this one. In a month, we had a book. And we just, that's how it happened. And then it, Kevin Van Dam and Al Linder were nice enough to do real nice forwards of the book for us. And uh, they were both really impressed with it. 